class is uh, it's very much interactive, right? So if you have questions, we'll always have time for questions when we hit like a, a good stopping point or the end of the night. But along the way, if someone uses a term you don't understand or there's something that you have, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll pause and answer your question and we kind of, we'll, we'll keep a flow going that way. Uh, the intent here is, is to educate uh, and to, to give you guys a good start in beekeeping. So, this club is called the, the Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa, FBI Club. The classes we're having tonight, they're free. Uh, there's no, I mean, we have, we have experienced people here. Uh, we have a facility that doesn't charge us anything. So we don't charge anything for the classes. The, the purpose of the club is to, to make better beekeepers. And our opinion is that that shouldn't cost a whole lot. Uh, if you have the desire to contribute, there's a green coffee can over there that we use to pay for cookies and coffee and stuff like that. You can contribute there if you'd like. It's not required at all. Um, but it is appreciated if you decide to do that. The, uh, I know enough about the origin of the club, and I might need your help, Jason, on this. I, uh, there's a, a gentleman who actually worked for the FBI, who was one of the charter members of, the, uh, of this club when it started a long time ago, long before I was around. So they decided to name the club Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa after the same FBI acronym. Yeah, Wyatt? Mike, Mike Wyatt. Wyatt, yeah, Mike Wyatt, I think, was, was that guy. The club's been around. I've been here for seven years. It was here a while before that. Um, I think we'll have some people that are part of the club kind of cycling and out as we're doing the classes. Some of them will just be here to visit, and some of them will, will do some teaching, too. But there's lots of experience here, and everyone here is pretty friendly. We, we want you guys to do well. We're here to share knowledge. So even after the class ends, we have monthly meetings as part of the FBI, and you can come to them, and we usually have a topic that we're trying to cover, you know, some educational piece, but it also is a free forum to basically say what's going on in your bee yard, uh, to get one of the mentors to come out there and check out your apiary, or um, spitball some problems you're having, just stuff like that. So anybody's free and welcome to come to that after the classes. Right. Ended. Those pick up, I think, in April. I think it's usually it's the third or fourth Thursday of the month. I can't remember which guys, but we'll put a calendar out as that. Uh, fourth Thursday. Fourth Thursday. Okay. And it's again, it'll be topical. The best part about the club there's no there's no rules, there's no membership, there's no officers. We get together and we talk about bees for a couple hours a night, and then we go home. There's there's no there, there's politics. One rule. There's one rule. If we ever have to call a vote, we're quitting the organization. We disband. Yeah, we just disband. It's, it's a very loose organization, and honestly, it fits the name. It's real friendly. I mean, uh, when I started taking beekeeping classes, I got, Jason actually mentored my son in 2015, and I got smoked on the terminology. I just wasn't engaged. The terminology, I didn't get it. But uh, the following year, I found an interest and started doing a little bit of my own alongside my son. And... Uh, Picked up on the terminology, took this class a second time, and it, things started to kind of to make sense. I, I'm a little bit of a slow learner, but repetition helped me out. And I've never had someone look at me and go, that's a stupid question. It just, we encourage interaction. I was one nice one, Jason. Come on in. We're just getting started. Have a seat. No, no problem. So uh, there's another, there's a statewide organization called the uh, Iowa Honey Producers Association. Um, because you're taking this class, we're going to we're going to you're a member of that organization by default for, for a year. That is a paid thing. Your first year, we take care of it for you. What that gets you is uh, one of the reasons we're asking for your email is there's a is it monthly? Yeah, it's a monthly newsletter that'll be emailed out to people. Right. Emailed out. Uh, if you want a hard copy, that can be arranged, but there's a fee for the hard copy. But um, and it's it's across the state of Iowa. It's not just one in. Have a seat wherever you're, wherever you're comfortable. It's across the state of Iowa, uh, and it's for really it's for everyone. We have commercial beekeepers that contribute to it. There's advertising there. There's articles about uh, some of the younger people in, in the organization, uh, as well as new beekeepers as well. There's there's content in there for everyone. Um, it's kind of a way to find out what's going on outside of the club, uh, but still still in Iowa. So good organization. Uh, Jason Foley is our IHPA president this year, as well. There we go. Right, what else we got? And webmaster, I'm pretty sure, right? That's you yes, guys. I'm the webmaster also. One of the programs we have is our queen program. Every year we'll have a queen. 
who it's her job to kind of be the ambassador for, for beekeeping around the state of Iowa. Um, they, they do lots of educational things. They'll talk to groups of kids or, or adults about beekeeping and, and kind of engage them in, a, in their situation, right? I, I've seen, uh, this is, oh, I'm gonna miss her name, Abigail Kelly, thank you. Uh, sometimes they'll go to a school or they'll go to a Cub Scout meeting or, or something and just be that topic of discussion for a while and kind of, again, the purpose of the organization is to, to teach people about beekeeping. Uh, that is, of course, Governor Kim Reynolds. We have a beekeeping or honeybee day uh, every year. This year it's March 30th. Uh, there'll actually be a deal at the Iowa State Capitol at uh, 7 to 9 a.m. I think that's right. Yes. I got that off the site, I think. It's early. But uh, there's typically a proclamation of some sort by the, by the governor. Uh, it's a way for us to advocate about beekeeping. So Iowa's an agriculture state, right? And without getting to the politics of all that, uh, there are a lot of influences for agriculture at the state capitol. Well, this is our chance to speak up for what, what we care about, about, about beekeeping in Iowa. Um, I think that's good enough for that. Last schedule real quick. Um, so I guess it was off. We're going to cover in the book chapters one and two tonight. I'll do chapter one, Jason will do chapter two. So already you're kind of behind. Welcome to beekeeping. It feels like we're kind of always behind when you're beekeeping because the bees have a mind of their own. Um, if you could read one and two and three before next class, you will kind of be where we're going to teach. That way you're reading the material and we're talking about it in class. Um, if we have a night that we can't can't get here because of weather or some other reason, um, that's why I want everyone's email address. I'll send out a, hey, we're not meeting tonight. I'll also put it in our, we have an FBI club uh, on Facebook as well. We'll put it there that, hey, we, we have to cancel class. And we'll always try to put that out as early as possible. I mean, we got to make a call like that by at the very latest noon on, on, on that day. Um, that's why we, we have a, an extra day here at the end on March 17th. If we don't use it, we'll just, as a group, we'll decide on the last night, do we need to meet one more time? Maybe question and answer, or maybe we're not quite through the book yet, and we'll decide if we use it or not. Um, it's our class, right? We can do with it what we want. So, does anybody else need to see this anymore? It's just every Thursday night, 6.30 to 8.30. Consecutive. I don't, there's nothing in there that we're skipping. We did not hit Valentine's Day this year, which is a good thing. All right. Uh, Start. Yeah. All right. Basics of beekeeping. Um, let's let's go for it. So, there's a lot of books out there. This is a very limited list, right? Our our content here in the in the presentations a little old, but uh, the first lessons of beekeeping is a book that you have. I, don't know, I hope that you have one. Um, I told you I got smoked on terminology when I first tried to to take this class and kind of get it. I just didn't get it. What's, uh, you'll hear terms like nuke and super and deep and brood and didn't know what those were. But I went to Walmart and bought beekeeping for dummies and I read that over, over a winter um, between my first and second year and it really started connecting the dots for me. I started to be able to understand kind of what all this terminology was because beekeeping, you know, like any trade or it has its own acronyms, it has its own terminology. You two will learn to use these. Uh, we'll, we'll help you to use them correctly. But once I could put all the, the terminology together, it just kind of made sense. The things that, that it seemed like everybody else knew what they were talking about, but I didn't because I didn't understand the terminology. So a good book to have. Um, there's a few others up here. The Hive and the Honeybee is an excellent book. Um, maybe not exactly beginner stuff, but it's it's good content. You can, for the most part, look up beekeeping books on Amazon or any other good uh, purchasing site, and there's a vast number of books to read. Um, we'll hit it on a slide here pretty soon, but keep in mind that beekeeping is very, very local. Um, what what works somewhere else? Uh, and by the way, this that's not. There, there's a lot of other content besides books. There's got to be 40 or 50 YouTube beekeepers out there that'll show you what's how they do things now. Which I think is great. You got to be careful. You got to be careful. Here. Well, again, don't, especially when you're new. You got to know why they're doing what they're doing, and maybe they're doing great, and maybe they're not. 
what a, what a commercial beekeeper is doing, which might be really cool and neat and efficient, isn't going to work for someone who's got two hives in their backyard. It, it just won't make sense. The ideas are there, they're sound, but they, they don't apply to every beekeeper. But if you can learn why they're doing what they're doing and understand that, it will teach you something about beekeeping. Whether it's something you can use or something you can just understand, it'll teach you something. So careful with your content, but there's a lot out there. There's a whole lot out there. And actually, these classes, we're going to take them and video them anyway, put them on YouTube too. So if we miss a night, we should really get you caught up. Thank you, Jason. What's next? These guys, <clears throat> those little dark spots, those are going to be your worst enemy for as long as you're keeping these. Uh, that is called the Varroa Destructor, or for short, we call them mites, Varroa mites. They um, will have the majority of an entire night or two. We'll talk about these little buggers. Um, but it's towards the end, we get into I think so. It's like class number four or five. five. Yeah. We'll talk about Varroa and lots of the things. But to, to make a long story short, these have not been around forever in the span of time. It's fairly recent, 20 years maybe, these guys have been around? Well, they've been around for millions of years. They but just weren't here. on honeybees. Our honeybees. For 99.9999% of that million right. years, they weren't on honeybees. Right. They were on Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, right. but they lived in a harmonious situation with them. And it was only when... Oh, the bee industry decided that they thought they could raise a bigger, better bee by doing this large cell foundation. And when they did that, it actually added a one to two days onto the maturity rate of honeybees. Well, that one to two day window of time was long enough that these mites could lay eggs in there, hatch out, uh, reach adulthood so that when that bee emerged from the cell, um, the mite didn't die off from being underdeveloped and basically drying up and desiccating. Well, that one to two days all of a sudden was that perfect time period that you could get two or three mites to mature inside of the honeybee colony and come out with that bee and then they just mass produced in there and they're kind of like uh, uh, West Nile virus and stuff like that in, in humans where it's transmitted from an insect into us. Uh, and Lyme disease with ticks, well, with bees, all of the nasty viruses and things out there piggyback in the bloodstream of these varroa mites, and they get introduced into the bee colonies that way. So that's why the bee industry hates these guys. What has it been? About 20 years about that, that the mites been yeah. a problem in right. Apis mellifera, the uh, uh, European honeybee that's the, basically, it, uh, European honeybee, falls under a whole bunch of other breeds that are out there, but that's what we have all over the world for, for farming and agriculture. So all that that Jason said, as a brand new beekeeper, a lot of it might went right over you. I'm we, sorry. We, that's okay. We will teach you what that really means because it's going to be important to you. If your bees are going to survive, it's a constant state of monitoring for those mites, knowing what you have, treating for them as appropriate, and repeating that process constantly, constantly. It, if we had, we, we do not have a silver bullet to put those things away where they're gone forever. We've tried lots of things, and again, we'll have almost a full night on this and other pests, but... Um, it's like farming with corn and trying to keep insects from eating your corn. Every year they come out with bigger and better things to fight the insects, right. and then the insects get used to it, and you got to come up with something else. Resistance. So. Right, right. It's a constant cycle. So, so beekeeping is very involved, right? This is not a passive activity. It's not. It's an active activity. You're going to be in your hive. You're going to be seeing how your bees look. You're going to learn their behavior. You're going to monitor for those mites. There's a way you can check what your mite load is, and then we will help you to understand what your options are. Do you need to treat? If you treat, how how do you treat? And we'll cover all that stuff yeah. when we get Later. into like chapter four or five, whichever it is. Yep. But Alrighty, let's, let's hit the fun stuff. So, open question. Why do you want to keep bees? Is anybody here willing to, to tell me why, why are you interested in keeping bees? I'll go first, but I'd like someone else to so think about your answer. I got into this because uh, my son got a scholarship from the Iowa Honey Producers Association. I took Ben, my son's name is Ben, to, to classes for a year. He couldn't drive yet, so I was his transportation. I kind of half listened, and um, I was interested, but didn't think it was really going to be my thing. Until, uh, so classes obviously now, wintertime, spring comes along. 
I'm a little more interested. And by the way, every time Ben and, and Jason are out inspecting this hive, they're at the hive, they're geared up, they're like right over at work, and I'm, I'm 60 yards away, kind of watching, and I'm the one that gets stumped. <laughs> <laughs> just, just happened. I don't know why, I don't know why. But, uh, but eventually I, I got to where Ben and I learned where we could do inspections of our hive on our own, and I got really fascinated by just what's going on in that box of critters. It was amazing. They're organized. They know what they're doing. They reproduce. They make honey. I have a garden. They pollinate my garden. And, and it's something I can talk about. You know, it's something where I, I have something that most people don't know about. It. If I tell somebody I'm a beekeeper, they usually have questions. And it's for me, it's also my mechanism to interact with people. Uh, what I do professionally is really boring to most of the world. And I used to be a fisherman, now a beekeeper. You know, so I like the interaction. Uh, that's one of the reasons I keep bees. Um, there's lots of reasons. Pollination, the list above. Survival, that's, that's good to keep in mind. Um, that's a debatable topic. There are people on both sides of that topic as to are we really helping them or not. Um, if you just listen to the news, they still are making it sound like honeybees are going to go extinct, but once you're in it and you have 50 hives, 100 hives, whatever, um, you start realizing, well, this is an agricultural product, and until we start hitting levels of colonies being decimated where it's 90% kill-off, yeah. you know you can every spring take a single beehive and make it into 8 or 10 other beehives. So when people are saying, oh, we had 20% loss, we had 30% loss, that's really easy to overcome by splitting your colonies out and making more colonies. So. It's not as bad as the news makes it sound. It, it isn't. And, and you'll have, you know, commercial beekeepers will say, well, beginner beekeepers maybe aren't the best to be keeping bees. And then, you'll, but then there's agricultural people saying, okay, well, what are you doing to help the bees? You're just making your living off them. It's, it's a political thing. There's people on all sides of it. And, and everybody has a point, but not everybody's right. So uh, beekeep for your reasons. Um, if you're doing this to make money, good luck. I wish you luck. Um, I asked a question of a, of a really experienced beekeeper one time. I said, okay, if I get this many hives, if I get to this point, and forget how I get there, but I get there, can I expect to make this much money? And it was significant. It was like $100 per hive. Can I expect to make this much money per year off of that hive? And their answer was, yeah, maybe, but you're going to spend $120 to make that $100. Um, and that, that can, that, there's some truth to that. Um, a lot of sweat equity, a lot of you doing stuff in beekeeping. Um, can you make a dollar on it? Yep, you can. You can. But it's, it, again, it's a very active thing. You're not going to stick a hive in your backyard and, and, and have it make you hundreds and hundreds of dollars every year just because it's there. It's a very active thing. Well, it's, it's just like, again, I keep saying the word agriculture, but it's like any agricultural product. If you were to all of a sudden say, I want to get into cattle production, you can't reasonably think that that first year that you have zero equipment, zero cattle, anything else, you just got some money in the bank, that you could go out there and buy 20 head of cattle, you know, go get some calves that are young that first year, and raise them up that first year, buy all the equipment that you need, and then still turn a profit. That equipment costs tons to get that you would need in, in you know, maintaining the cattle, having the fences, the feed, the barn, everything else there. Year number two, um, you sold off some of your herd there to make some beef and you recouped a little bit of your loss, but year number two, you're still paying off the bills of that barn and everything else. You're hoping that you get a lot of calves born from the herd that you maintained and stuff, but it's several years that you roll over before you might actually start turning a profit. Beekeeping is the exact same way. Um, first couple of years, don't expect to make much of anything off of it. You might recoup some of your money, but you've invested up front quite a bit. Um, you get into it three, four, five years, and you're splitting off your own colonies. You're bringing in, you know, 500 pounds of honey, 1,000 pounds of honey, or you've got um, a deal with the local hy store, and you're selling bottles of it there. You're going to farmer's markets and selling. Maybe you're producing um, beeswax candles or something. You've got to then start diversifying what you're producing and yeah, you can then start turning a profit and you grow and grow with that and you can turn it into a real business at that point. 
but don't expect one or two years into it that you're going to be self-sufficient and be able to quit your day job. It just yeah. doesn't move that quick. No, it's a great hobby. I'm at the point, so I'm seven years in, I'm at the point where I have enough hives, and my number right now is, I'm not bragging because it took a long while, it's 50, but I, my bees multiply faster than I can buy equipment to put them in, so I need to either let some of those go, right? They swarm and I don't recover them, or, or I sell them, or I find a way to, to get money enough to keep that growth going. But if I, if I try to grow as fast as they're trying to grow, I don't have enough money to do that. So it's a whole, again, it's a, it's a style. It's how, how, what, what are your ambitions? So, and that's my question to you guys. Who here, I know we're all here because we're interested in beekeeping, but can anyone tell me why? Why are you interested in keeping bees? Yes, ma'am. So I went to, the governor has in February tea talks every Saturday, mm -hmm. and just before the pandemic. So two years ago in February, I went to one of her tea talks, and um, it was a group of people that were talking about saving the pollinators. And we, when we first bought our property, my husband had bees, and I was like, you've lost your mind. <laughs> but after watching them and listening to them, it was just like, it just touched my heart, and I wanted to have bees. That's good. One of the things I like to do as a beekeeper is um, whenever I don't have anything I have to do with my bees, which once in a while happens, I'll just go sit out by where they are. I have some at my home and just, just watch them. Especially if there's a, you know, the term, a pollen flow or nectar flow, nectar flow going on where these bees are busy. They got stuff to do. They don't even care that I'm there. They'll go right by me. They might bump into me once in a while, but just to watch them, just to watch them, to me, is just, uh, nothing else matters for a while kind of a thing. I enjoy that. Anybody else? Why do you want to keep bees? Don't be shy. There's no wrong answers. Only there might be some. Yes, ma'am. Want to become self sufficient. That's a good way to do it. So, you need sugar source. Sugar source is, yeah. Uh, we don't buy a whole lot of refined sugar in my house anymore. Um, mm -hmm. We go through a lot of honey. I mean, a lot more, a lot more than I thought we would. I, I have a several bottles of honey that um, that we empty and just refill for just our home use. That's a lot of honey, you know, uh, a couple pounds in a month, maybe. That's a lot we go through. So, your first year, you won't get a whole lot of honey off that colony. It's got to build all the wax on the frames, and they got to burn 10 pounds of honey to produce one pound of wax. So that first year, you won't have a big turnout. But just having one beehive, you can get anywhere from like 50 to 100 pounds in a single season off of a beehive. So, and to put that in other terms, that you could picture that as five to eight gallons of honey you're going to get off of each beehive. So that. Convert that into sugar, and you're looking at, uh, let's see, the ratio there would be about 70 to 130 pounds of sugar that you normally would have bought at the store because honey is actually sweeter than sugar, so you have to use less in recipes. So, and it's, of course, it's, it's only processed as much as you process it, so for the most part, unprocessed, unless you decide to heat it, which is about the only thing we can do to it. All right, uh, yeah, so breeds of honeybees. Again, a limited list, there's more than this, uh, and we'll, we'll get into this. So all these are Apis mellifera, European honeybee. Right. But besides that, that's like saying cats. Yeah. And then you have all the different breeds of cats there, or dogs, and all the different breeds of dogs. Well, in the honeybee world, that list should really be like 20 long, probably, but we've got a few examples up there of different breeds. Yeah. So. You're, the ones you'll hear about the most uh, are Carniolians, or Carnies, uh, and Italians, and Russians. Um, most of your outfits that are just putting out bees, these are mostly outfits in California, this is their business, they're usually working in Italians or Carniolian type bees. Uh, Jason is a breeder of, of Russian Queens, so um, those are somewhat pre prevalent around here. They all have different traits. Uh, things that they're better at than maybe some other some other lines. Um, we'll get deeper into this. Uh, your book will touch on this a bit too. Um, there's also a lot of opinion around this, and some of it's experience and some of it's repeated. So, Mike, go ahead. Are there any honeybees that are native in North America? Nope. What not not what we have here. They come over on the Mayflower, I'm pretty sure, and, and other boats. But there, no. There's a little argument to that because they've like found fossil evidence but but like there's no recorded history in like native tribes of you know the Americas and stuff like that 
of honeybees being in the United States area. Um, but the weird thing is, like, down in Mexico, they do have some of that stuff, and there's no, like, magic border wall that would have kept honeybees from coming across into the United States, but for any recorded history of it, yeah, it came over on sailing vessels with, like, the original colonies that formed the United States and uh, trading vessels and stuff. That's about the first time you can find honeybees listed as coming into the United States, and thus why they say that uh, the honeybee is not a native pollinator. Right, you'll, you'll hear that. But they do very well here. And um, again, there's there's an argument on all sides of that. Are they harming native pollinators? Why? Well, you know, honestly, that's not my concern. My, my concern is I found something I like to do, so <laughs> I'm going to do it. Um, all right. Uh, we'll talk more about these. Uh, at some point, if you're going to keep bees or don't want to order and buy bees, let me recommend to you not to buy anything that's not local. If you buy bees from non-local, you, you, your support mechanism is not local. It's somewhere else. If you buy a package of bees, uh, Tyson's just down the road, in direction turn. Yeah, Tyson's. They, they'll sell you a package of honeybees. They don't know anything about bees. Uh, if your bees are not healthy, uh, you have a dead queen in that package, they, they're, they're, they're going to say, can't help you. I'm so, not even that opposed to buying bees over the web and having them shipped to a person. My big thing is big box stores because what's happening is those bees are being packaged up by real beekeepers, but then it's going to somebody else that's a middleman that's also then shipping it through a shipping company to then a distribution source for like Tyson's or Fleet Farm and etc. And then the bees are moving out from there. Well, packaged bees only have three to five days usually more around the three-day time frame, to get in your hands from the bee yard before you start having major bee loss in those packages, before you start running the risk of like their feed can that's keeping them alive, running out of syrup, and then you getting a package that is just completely dead. And when you're getting at Tyson's, you, again, as uh, Ted was starting to mention there, they don't know anything about this. They are just store clerks that are handing you a product and you ask them, well, what about this? How long has it been for this? Um, why do I see two inches of dead bees on the bottom of this package? Well, they have no clue. They'll just hand it to you and you're on your own. Yeah. So that's the whole purpose of this club and these classes is to avoid the you're on your own part. So there, there's plenty of folks here. These guys are all active. Um, you, can, you can purchase bees from or get curious, you know, inquire with them what they have to offer. Uh, we'll, likely fit with what your beginning needs are. Um, you buy bees from someone local, they're, I can tell you, because I know most of them, they're going to want to keep you as a customer, so they're going to be there for you. And that's that's better than any box store uh, can do. Um, if you need uh, other sources than what's on this slide here, that monthly newsletter that Ted was mentioning that's sent out by the Iowa honey producers, there's ads in there from local bee producers and stuff that gets printed. So, yeah. so um, let's let's go over the, the main sources of bees for, for anyone, but especially for beginners. We mentioned a package of bees, which is usually two or three pounds of honey bees. These are likely not all from the same hive. These are typically shaken off of um, probably off of hives that have just gotten done pollinating almonds in California. Sorry, let's define what package is. It, it's a box it, it's a, it's like a it, it has four sides on it and then the other two sides just have screen over it yeah. and it's literally got a whole bunch of loose bees that were funneled into this container that air can pass in and out of there there will be a queen cage that's hanging inside of there and a syrup can yeah. and literally those bees because they've been away from their own hive they have had two or three days with that queen and now they think that's their queen. And all they need to be is dumped into your equipment and they'll stay there with the queen and start building comb and stuff. So that's what a package is. A nuke is four or five frames that somebody took out of their beehive and put in another container. And either they put a mated queen in there or they put a cell in there that was going to hatch into a queen and came back and checked on it a, a couple weeks later to see if she was laying, and when she's laying, 
that gets handed off to you and all you do is you put that in your hive and they continue growing. So that's just two variations, a nuke or a passage. So when you get those bees, are they already treated for mites? No. Well, if they were, I wouldn't trust it. Because you don't, the truth is you don't know. You, they may have caught a mite treatment, again, if they're packaged bees or nuke, they might have caught a mite uh, treatment from where they were before, but you're not going to know. You're not going to know. It if is if they're coming from a major company, the parent hives that supply those bees are required to be treated. Um, and that's part of state inspections and getting uh, your your inspection sign off to transport across state lines. Uh, if it's coming from Joe Blow that owns 50 hives in the corner of the state or whatever <laughs> and shook some of his own stuff, there's sometimes inspections that are skipped and treatments that weren't done or this or that. Now, when it's in package form, most people don't treat the bees in the package. They treated the parent hives because uh, those treatments are kind of harsh on the bees. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to treat it as a whole colony than it is to take it already in this confined space and give it a proper dose that doesn't harm the bees, if yeah. that makes sense to you. Right. So by the way, nuke is short for nucleus, which is basically a fourth of a full immature hive. Right? We'll get into hive equipment, what it looks like next week. But it's if five frames is a nuke, 20 frames mostly populated with bees would be a full hive uh, before you put any uh, boxes on it to harvest honey off of. So it's like a fourth of a hive. Um, you can buy a hive from a beekeeper. Uh, that's typically not a spring thing. That's going to be a late spring to early summer thing. Uh, it's an option for midsummer, but if you're going to keep bees. One thing we have in Iowa is the winter. And uh, your bees are going to need to have time to prepare for winter. So if you're starting something brand new, in July or later, it needs to be really good shape and mature, and you're going to have to need a lot of luck or feed it, which is a little bit expensive, to get it ready for winter. So you're starting in the springtime for, for a reason, for a good reason. Let them bring in those natural resources that are local to them, see how strong they are and how much help they might need that first year. And your goal, your first year goal in beekeeping with a hive is to get it through that first winter. If it makes you honey, that's great. That's a bonus, but your goal is to get that hive through winter, learn as a beekeeper, you'll become a better beekeeper year over year, but that goal is to get it through winter. Um, honey production is just a bonus. All right. Um, I touched on this, what works in Florida or any other part of the world isn't necessarily going to work here in Iowa. Beekeeping is very, very local. Um, the bees themselves will behave a little differently uh, here than they were, you know, when we have warmer climates down the south. Uh, they have problems that we don't have. Um, one of the pests is the um, small hive beetle, which is prevalent in the south because the south doesn't get cold enough really to shut them down for a few months. They fight them all the time and, and to a larger degree than we have to. We'll see a beetle here. I'll see them in my hives from time to time, but there's not enough of them to really do any damage. Different problems depending on where you're keeping bees. So beekeeping is local. Um, reason we have this club, talk to beekeepers in your area and understand why they do what they do. Don't, don't do a straight copy of what they do. Know what you're doing and why. Ask questions. Beekeepers are talking. I'm not a talkative person unless we're talking about bees. Um, beekeepers are talkative. They're happy to answer your questions or maybe even go out and be on site with you to help you with some things. Um, and this is a continual education thing too. Probably another reason why I like beekeeping. The challenges don't stop coming. The, the, it's not, you know, every year is different. Every week is different with beekeeping. There's a new problem to figure out all the time. And, and it's doable. It's doable. Um, so if something goes wrong, and I've had things go wrong, a lot of things are wrong. Uh, find out why, correct it, learn from the lesson, and, and, and keep on keeping bees. Yes? So do most of the beekeepers that sell, you know, the bees, do they all send them to California? Or? Not everybody. There's some people that do it for a living. That's the one that's that you got was from Epp or, or Eber or wherever. Eber, yeah. yeah. They, they Eber. just came from California. The vast majority of people that are going to be selling bees in Iowa do also do pollination. There are there's going to be a handful of people out there that are just making 10 or 20 nucleus colonies and selling them, and they may not be doing pollination because you know they only own. 30 or 40 hives and 
they haven't gotten connections yet to jump on a semi load. But at some point, as those people that are selling 10 or 20 nukes get to the level of wanting to sell 50 nukes and have more colonies, sooner or later the temptation is there to take the bees out to California. And really, it's, it's twofold. Sending your bees out to California does not ensure their survival, but it makes for an easier winter because they're going in November when they're starting to shut down here, going out to a holding yard somewhere where it's 70 degrees in the middle of the daytime. Uh, their nectar flow isn't going on or anything like that, but the bees get to move out of our 40 and 50 degree days to 70 degree days, and then they get to sit there when it middle of January, it might get down to 50, 60 degrees in the middle of the day and stuff. So they're still in nice, moderate climates at that point. So your hives that would be suffering in minus 20 degrees here have got to got around that, circumvented it being out there. So it, it makes your, if you were going to have 30% losses, let's say, um, it might knock it down to 7 or 10% losses just because it's so much easier climate out there. And then the second fold of that is you're earning like 180 bucks a colony having them out there. Now out of that 180 bucks, you might have lost $25, $30 to shipping charges, which still leaves you with 150 bucks. If they had to feed your bees while it was out there, you might pay a dollar for a pollen patty. So you're still getting $149. You might have paid for a gallon of syrup, which would cost you like another four bucks. So you're at $145 for that colony. Well, you just sent 50 of them out there. They get placed in the almonds, 50 times $145, that's coming back to you, where normally they would have sat here dormant in the wintertime not doing anything. I guess I forgot, it's really threefold is the benefit, because when your bees come back in April, they're boiling over having been in almonds for the last two months getting all that pollen and they're ready to be split right then and there you've got bees coming out every corner of that box and you're just going all right here's a nuke 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 and splitting them off and giving them some fresh comb and letting them build back and stuff so you right there have just gotten a month to two months jump on everybody else by having your bees come back from pollination services. So it's it's so beneficial once you grow big enough to send them out there that nobody that has a ton of hives doesn't doesn't do it. Yeah. It's beneficial. So a couple couple things. I'm one of the guys that has 50 hives and I just can't quite bring myself to send them out away because I like them. Um, I'll get there probably someday. I'm on that journey. Um, there's a lot of work to do to prepare for that, right? You just don't go, hey, Hey, commercial beekeeper, can I send my four hives out with you? It kind of doesn't work that way. There's more, there's more to it than that. Um, so everybody understand, we've thrown the term loss out there, and we've thrown a percentage on it. Do you guys understand? I want to make sure you understand what that is. So over winter, right, let, let's call that here from October until probably, let's call it April, because I lose hives in April every year. Um, that time period, winter, we're talking winter loss. So for every 10 hives in Iowa, or for beekeeper, uh, a 30% loss means three of those are going to not make it for one reason or another. Uh, starvation, uh, they were just too small to keep warm, they had disease, they, they, a disease infected them and, and between the disease and the cold, it got them, uh, they had a moisture problem in the hive so they, they couldn't vent enough moisture so they froze, but that loss is a real thing. Um, when you have two hives, that 30% loss is intimidating because you may lose one or both of them that first year, especially if you're brand new. But as you grow as a beekeeper, if you increase your hive count, when you have 10 hives and you lose two or three, you can replace that pretty easily. But you have one or two and you lose one or two, that can be really discouraging. So again, that's why we're here, to support you and to help, help that out. Typically the sophomore year in beekeeping, that second year, for some reason, it's just a little harder, and it was for me too. I, my losses were really bad my second year. <clears throat> I had a stand of bees that collapsed on me. Lost three, three out of four because of that. Um, just the others that, that didn't fall down. Um, just I just had loss. I just it was me being new, and maybe those queens that were in their second or third year that I had, uh, I wasn't picking up that they weren't as healthy as they should be. It, it happens, but. Um, the club's here to support, 
this is if this were easy, everybody would do it. It's doable, but it's active. You got to be engaged in order to do well to do well at it. We don't want to scare you here. Your it's, first year as a beekeeper is probably your easiest year. Yeah. You're you're starting out fresh. And the bees that are building all that brand new comb, it's going to be the cleanest environment that those bees are ever going to have. It's, it's not going to be laced with pesticides, herbicides, any other things in the environment because it's all brand new wax that they're building. Uh, starting out brand new, they also are going to have the lightest exposure to mites and beetles and wax moths and any other problems out there. So your first year is usually your easiest as long as you've got them fat enough to go into winter, you usually come out of it great. Year number two is where you start to compound problems and also you're like, well, I made it my first year. No, I don't need to check for mites. No, I did this just fine. That was yeah. fine. And you start cutting corners coupled with wax that now is absorbing stuff out of the environment. Your situation's getting a little dirtier. Uh, you start out in the spring with a full hive that already has everything there and your mite levels jump up a lot faster than that year that nothing was there. Right. And year number two is where you have more of your problems. Yeah. Uh, that is why there is an entire chapter here that is going to cover um, just the pest problems and pathogens that beehives can have. And it's like anything out there, you know. Uh, if, if this was a master gardener class, we would be talking about uh, blight on your tomatoes, or we'd be talking about cutworms, or we'd be talking about any of the other things that could happen out there that could ruin your garden. So that's why we got a whole chapter on this. We are actually that's burning time a heck of a lot faster so than what Eric Neuer and... <laughs> And so we'll, we'll, we'll go through the next. But this is, beekeeping is a fantastic journey, by the way. So don't don't be discouraged. But we'll be very honest with that. Thing. What do we have next? We're actually on my chapter here, so it's oh, break time. So let's take a break. We'll uh, get back together probably about ten minutes, guys. My name is Jason Foley. I own Foley's Russian Bees, that flyer that you guys are seeing around here. And uh, if you ever come out to our farm. We'll have a big like log out in front of the place that says Honey Hollow because the farm itself is called Honey Hollow. Uh, uh, Honey Hollow Apiary and Gardens LLC is the legal uh, name of the company there. But a um, few years back, I met a little broom maker and uh, then got married to her and we kind of combined our hobbies and set up a little store on our farm then that uh, she can make her 1800s handcrafted brooms and I can go ahead and take all the beehive equipment that I'm already making for my own operation and put it on the store shelves there and kind of sell it to the community. So we took our, our two little hobbies and uh, mine wasn't really a hobby anymore. I already was commercial queen producer sending them all over the United States and stuff. But um, you know, the, the woodworking was my hobby. So we were, put those together and did that. but. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I, I guess I should say, like Ted was saying there, I am the current president of the Iowa Honey Producers. I am also their webmaster. I am a member of the Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa. Uh, if we really want to get technical about stuff, I'm also a master beekeeper and the four-time recipient of the University of Florida's Ma uh, Beekeeper of the Year Award. So. If you want any bee nerd facts, just come out. Um, honeybees in the world. All right, we're going to be covering the biology of the bee, I guess. So, the honeybee, it is... A lot of people are going to see striped insects out there, and all the time I get people saying, I've got... A honeybee colony that I need removed because it's in a log at my house, it's in uh, landscaping bricks, it's in this and that. It always turns out to be something other than honeybees when I show up. Well, the honeybee is an insect that is broken into three body sections. And one important factor there is it doesn't have two wings, it actually has four. Uh, the wings are connected together so that connected with little J-hooks, you could call it, but um, 
So when the bee is flying, they function as just um, like a pair of wings instead of four wings. But when the bee lands, it can dislodge them apart, clean them, and then rehook them back together. Uh, the bee has a compound eye here. Uh, their eyesight actually works where they see the colors blue, green, and ultraviolet. So that flower that you and I see as red doesn't look red to the bees, it actually looks gray. And most flowers under ultraviolet light, if they are a flower that needs pollination, uh, will actually have striped lines or other patterns that guide insects down to where the pollen and the nectar is at in the flower. So flowers look very different to insects that are meant to pollinate them. Uh, a bee will have six legs. Um, Mandibles, a proboscis, which is just a really long tongue. Um, don't want to get too technical with this stuff here. A uh, big thing that you should know is that it's got a stinger. Um, <laughs> honeybees can only sting you once and they'll leave their stinger behind. They're a insect that lives as a giant colony and it's for the colony's survival that each, uh, each individual is most concerned about. They're not concerned about their own life. So Mother Nature has kind of developed them over time to leave their stinger behind with a venom sac that can deliver the biggest punch, the most pain to drive off, say, that badger, that raccoon, that bear that was trying to get into the colony. It would leave the most poison behind to try to drive off the attacking animal. Well, with other insects that are more solitary, like, I, you're, you're going to argue that wasps aren't solitary, but they're kind of a eusocial insect, and I don't want to get into that, but they can live as a colony, but they can live in as individual as well. So with them there, their stingers uh, aren't left behind. They have straight stingers where honeybees have barbed stingers, and they can sting you over and over and then just fly off and then sting something else. They're kind of jerks in that way. But um, uh, so anyhow, the honeybee there, I'm kind of getting off track here, but the honeybee here is designed to protect the hive as if the hive itself was a living organism. Um, trying to think here of any other interesting facts here about the bees. Uh, bees actually fly by having uh, muscles inside their body that, uh, in this section here, uh, they're vertical and sideways, and they actually are flexing the body part and not the wing muscles themselves to fly the wings. Um, they breathe by basically allowing air to passively come in and out of little holes down their body called spiracles. There's little chambers inside there that uh, sort of are like lungs, but our lungs are, we breathe, you know, our chest comes out and we suck air in. The bee doesn't really do that um, forcibly. The air kind of goes in there and goes through a semi-permeable membrane into um, an open cavity of fluid that has a pump that just recycles the fluids around in there rather than a circulatory system that's trying to push it through major arteries and veins. Um, so anyhow, I'm getting way more into the science. Of Tell us about those wax glands. Uh, oh. Um, the wax glands are in the abdomen here, and you'll see uh, the different segments of the bee. If you saw a, you know, do we have a nice photo? Um, it almost looks like little plates that are overlapping on the bee's abdomen there. And when a bee, uh, when a bee has collected a bunch of nectar and comes back to the hive there, and the hive has been doing a really good job of collecting nectar, it can't find a place to put it. So it keeps it in its stomach, and suddenly the bee is like burning all these extra carbohydrates in its system. It needs to get rid of it somehow. And if you've ever, after a really big Thanksgiving meal, started running a fever and feeling a little sweaty and overly warm, the bee is having that happen to itself, but the bee doesn't sweat like you and me. It sweats wax out of those uh, uh, glands on the underside of its abdomen there. So uh, the process of having a really good nectar flow and not having a place to put that nectar 
causes the bees to produce the wax to build more cone to be able to store nectar. So if you are in a nectar dearth where there's not good nectar around, the bees don't sweat wax out and don't build good comb for you. So that's why in the springtime you usually hear beekeepers saying, feed your bees right off the bat. A, they don't want them to run out of food in the colony and die, and B, if you're just starting off with a package, you want that package to grow wax for you really quick so they have a bigger and bigger home there. So that feeding right off the bat will give them a jump start and help you out that way. Cool. Yes, highly specialized body structure. Well, well, we got there. So yeah. a few things with the honeybee here uh, off this topic. The bee has uh, hairs all over its body branched hairs, and that serves multiple purposes here. Um, a, when the bee is flying and has these hairs, it statically charges the bee. You, you probably are thinking, well, that doesn't really help out in any way, but um, if you've ever noticed when you have like static cling, you're gonna get pet hair just sticking to you, you're gonna get dust sticking to you, you're gonna get everything sticking to your clothes with static electricity. When the bee's visiting flowers, it literally sucks the pollen to the bee's body through that static charge. Um, on the bee's body here, you have uh, extra long branched hairs. It's known as um, the pollen basket there. Um, and the bees like to clean and prune themselves and push that pollen down there and collect it on their legs. Pollen is a protein source that the bees Adult bees eat a little bit of it for themselves, but at that point, once they're adults, like 90% of their diet, maybe 80% of their diet is carbohydrates just to keep them going day in and day out. But that pollen is very, very important for the young developing larva. So the queen will lay an egg, we'll get into the life cycles, but 80% of a larva's diet is pollen because it's protein. Um, think of it this way. If you were that big and expected to, in about 21 days, grow to this size, you're going to need massive amounts of protein. And that's essentially what happens to the bees there. They just need, uh, from the moment they hatch as an egg and develop as a larva and pupate, they need tons and tons and tons of protein. So that is why bees collect pollen there. Um, other specialized structures of the bee is an elongated proboscis or tongue so that when they land on flowers, they can get down in there and pull the nectar from deep inside the flower. I'm not sure if that's a dandelion in that picture or not, but it's closer sure. to what it looks like it. But dandelion will become your favorite flower. Um, as, as we come out of winter, dandelion is in Iowa, typically the, the first, uh, let's call it a flower, would be nice and call it a flower, that produces both pollen and nectar, which is an indication that if you've gotten your bees that far through winter, you probably get, they're probably going to make it. They've gotten to where you've gotten into a natural food source and you maybe not have to supplement as, as much as you have had to over the winter. So. I guess a couple other things on specialized structure. I mentioned their eyesight for being able to see flowers and ultraviolet and know the ones that would have pollen and nectar for going into them. Um, and then to couple with that, Honeybees are considered the most effective pollinator out there. There are a lot of native pollinators, and there are a lot of birds and butterflies and other things that can help pollinate flowers through either passively brushing up against the flowers or trying to also feed on nectar out of them, like hummingbirds. They try to get nectar out of flowers there as well. But all of those other pollinators, including butterflies, they'll randomly hit blossoms of any type of plant out there. So that butterfly, let's say it visits an apple blossom for the very first meal of the day. Well, then it flies off and it goes to a dandelion. And then it flies off and it lands on a, a cucumber blossom in your garden. And then it flies over to a rose. Well, the pollen from a rose does not help a cucumber develop seeds. The pollen from that cucumber doesn't help the dandelion out, and the dandelion doesn't help the apple out. You need apple blossom pollen on apple blossoms to produce apples, and to also produce the seeds in the apples. 
The same thing with the cucumbers. You need pollen from one cucumber blossom to go to another cucumber blossom. In the insect world, honeybees are the only massive colony organism and the only, I think, native pollinators. Uh, there's no individual one out there that also has that trend of the honeybees. But when a worker bee leaves the colony first thing in the morning, if, let's say, it goes to an apple blossom, for the rest of that entire day, it will only go to apple blossoms of the same type. It only wants to visit the same type of flower all day long. Now, yeah, it's got 50,000 sisters that are going to other plants and stuff, but that worker is going to go from apple blossom to apple blossom to apple blossom to apple blossom. And every time she goes to a new blossom, her body's covered with pollen from the others, and she goes ahead and um, pollinates. Sorry, too much coffee today pollinates those flowers with the appropriate pollen. Another one of her sisters that day started out on cucumbers, goes to cucumber, 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 cucumber all day long. So that is why the honeybee is considered the most effective pollinator out there. They tend to, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, honeybees tend to exploit a, a resource, a food resource, until it's done, right? Until it's, it's either Weather has happened and it's no longer producing, or they've exhausted it. They'll produce, they'll get everything they can off of it, and then they'll find something else and they communicate within the hive. The bees communicate to each other, we'll get into how later. And, and so if there are bees that don't have a destination, that communication happens and then they'll lock onto that source, whether it's pollen or nectar, and they'll just hammer until they've exploited as much as they can and they'll, they'll find another one. So. Yeah, there, there's, different videos out there that you can watch where they're doing a waggle dance and a bee will come back and be really excited about a pollen or nectar source and pass on the information to its sisters in the hive so they can go back to that area. The bees are looking for the biggest bang for their buck. So if suddenly a field of clover comes into bloom, the bees might turn off of something else that wasn't really feeding them that well and will hit that clover field instead. Right. Right. Anything else here, Jason? No, go ahead. All right, so I was talking about how you develop from something this size into a full-size human. This here is what the eggs look like on comb. This is a cross-section, so somebody took a frame of bees like this and they just cut a knife through it, turned it on side and shot a photo of it here. But freshly laid eggs here are like little grains of sand, and they're really hard to see in nice, nice clean, white wax. Um, that's actually why if you buy a beekeeping kit or whatever, uh, doesn't matter where you get it, nine times out of ten, that uh, the lower boxes of the hive will have black frames in there. And that's so when the, the queen is laying eggs, you pick it up and those little white eggs really stand out against the black frame and you can see them better. So, day one, the queen lays an egg. Next. Um, about two days later, the eggs start to hatch. And this is really not a good comparison here because it's like fresh eggs, and those there are larvae that are actually multiple days old. Yeah, yeah. yeah, those are, are kind of chunky larvae and stuff. But these will hatch. And initially, when they first hatch, you might look in there, and it just looks like a little wet spot. And if you hit the sun just right, you might see the tiniest of little horseshoes in there in the middle of that little bit of liquid. The liquid is actually uh, bees that have come in there and already started feeding that larva. They're constantly being fed. Um, the first one to two days of its life, it'll actually be given royal jelly. And from there on out, the majority of its food that it's being given is bee bread that the, the worker bees are going to. Bee bread is just a term. The pollen that is being stored in the colony, the bees mix a little bit of um, fresh nectar with it, and there's a fun fungus that lives in the colony naturally that'll then ferment and help break down that pollen into the substance known as bee bread. And the bees then can feed it to the young larva. Uh, that fermentation process actually breaks the outer shell of the pollen down so that it can then um, be used for nutrition a lot better. Think of it like 
us eating corn, we can't digest corn very well. Well, pollen without that fungus can't be digested by the bees very well. We'll hit on that, uh, that royal jelly term again later. So Yeah, in the queen chapter we talked about yeah. that a lot. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So once the larvae gets large enough, and that is unfortunately a very fuzzy photo there, but when the larva gets large enough there, uh, worker bees will come around and they'll go ahead and cap it over. They'll put a uh, coating of wax over the top there. And as the larva inside there pupates, uh, goes ahead and metamorphoses, uh, it'll actually go from wax to being sort of like a um, velvety sort of cocoon type texture. Um, if you look at it, it'll look like bubble wrap that you want to sit there and pop the bubble. Don't pop any of your bubbles. Those are little bees that are going to be born and stuff there. But inside of there, inside of the cells there that have the little velvet capping on there, the bee is actually turning from this worm and turning into something that looks sort of like a bee. And then in the matter of about a day there when it's, it's going to emerge out, it starts having a color transformation and its eyes are the first thing that turn color and then its body will start to change color. The wings will start to uh, sort of, if you guys have ever seen a butterfly emerge out of the chrysalis, it comes out and then the wings pump up there. Well, the bee will actually inside of the cell already have the wings pumping up on that last day before then it chews the capping and emerges out. And it emerges out as just the the fuzziest little teddy bear you've ever seen for a bee. Yep. I got a picture of that. Let's see it. Go for it. Boom. Mm -hmm. Yep. So where we saw on the other slides that the, the bees always stay fuzzy to some degree, but a baby bee emerging out is just so utterly fuzzy. It's kind of adorable. In a stingy kind of way. <laughs> well, they, they actually won't sting you until they get to later stages of their life and stuff. So right here, you could pick up any of these emerging bees and they actually physically can't sting you at that stage of their life. It, they have to get older to be able to do that. But uh, um, I'm not sure if we covered in this chapter, but as a bee ages, it takes on different jobs within the colony. And the first job this little girl has to do is she is going to be a nurse bee and she turns around and she cleans out her cell. And she then goes around and finds other larvae that have uh, just hatched from an egg and need to be fed. And at this stage of her life, she has an overactive gland in her head that's producing all this good food uh, that I called royal jelly earlier. It's called the hyperphalangeal gland, but it's overactive at this stage of her life. And she'll go around and on those newly hatched eggs be depositing uh, royal jelly to the young, two-day-old larva at that stage. Um, and as time goes by, then she will be tending to the queen, and then she will go ahead and she will be uh, building wax in the colony. She will be a bee that goes down to the entrance of the colony and the foragers. She will take honey through mouth-to-mouth -mouth trophallaxics, which is just, they connect tongues, and the worker bee that was out there, forager bee out there, uh, will basically just by mouth give their nectar stores to her, and she'll go up into the colony and deposit it in cells and start blowing bubbles in it or fanning her wings and dehydrating it down into honey. Uh, she has a stage of her life where she's a mortuary bee, and any bee that happens to die in the colony, she will take them out of the colony and either fly off a few feet with them and deposit them or just dump them outside the hive. The last stages of a bee's life is when they're old and grumpy, they become foragers and they start running back and forth between the hive and flowers. Now at a flower, a bee is very, very docile and timid, but when it's back at the hive, it's then ready to defend the hive. So the best time to get into your hive is the middle of the day when all the foragers, the old grumpy bees, are out there tending to flowers, and you're left with a lot of nurse bees in your colony. If the sun just came up, don't get into that colony just yet. The sun's going down leave your colony alone, because all the grumpy bees are going to be back at that time of the day. Uh, so I said that the last stages is the forager. It's also known as guard bee stage, too. 
So some of the bees there, these old bees, do like to hang out on the front boards of your hive. And it's to keep other bees from coming and stealing the honey out of their colony or to keep a mouse from grow, uh, going up inside your hive and stuff like that. But a few guard bees or old forager bees will stay at your colony at all times, but just most of them won't be out actually working. We'll hit it again in another class, but these bees always have something to do, right? And first thing after they emerge, go clean your room. I love this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, for the first year to 50 years of your beekeeping experience, this might be near impossible for you to do. Uh, most people after the first year or two, you get really good at spotting queens. I just throw that 50 year out there because I have people that'll come up to me and go, how do you spot a queen? And I'm like, you've been keeping bees for 30 years. How do you not find the queens in your hive there? Well, one of the things that'll help you find queens in your colony is that most of the time, bees around the queen will be facing her. That's not the best not shot of that. Here is one that I'll pass around to you guys, but um, you'll notice that every bee in this photo is looking at the queen. She is admitting um, queen substance at all times, which is basically chemical pheromones that put the hive at ease, uh, let them know her physical and health state, um, let them know that she's uh, capable of laying it, all those things, but it tells them that's our queen. And a lot of these nurse bees will want to tend to her. They clean her, they feed her. She doesn't actually go to any cells and pick out food herself. All these bees just walk up to her and feed her by mouth to mouth there, but they're tending to her at all times. And she's getting a steady diet of that royal jelly that I talked about where all of the worker bees of the colony only for the first like two days of their life got a little bit of that royal jelly. She's fed it day in and day out by the worker bees. Uh, she does get some bee bread. She does get some nectar from them as well. Uh, but that royal jelly is magical for her because instead of her living the 30 to 45 days that all of her kids do, she lives for up to seven years. In most cases, three or four years, but she can live up to seven years, and it's all because she's being fed a special diet there of concentrated royal jelly all the time. So, but anyhow, that there will really help you find the queen, the bullseye out there. Another thing is all the bees in that hive, um, feel free to pass that. Another thing would be all the bees in this colony are going to look like they are on their third or fourth cup of Starbucks for the day. Meaning they're all over the frames, they're moving around, they're busy doing this and that. Well, the queen, she's going to move a lot different than any other bee. She's more like a, a lumbering ox out there and she's just casually pushing bees out of her way and then checking out a cell and laying an egg. But she has a real methodical move to her where everybody else is just all panicked and moving really quick. Um, something else that'll help grab your attention to finding the queen, not the painted dot, that's not always the case, but this area of her body is going to be super shiny where all the other bees seem kind of hairy in that area. And when you've got the frame in the sunlight there, sometimes that little bit of glitter will hone you in on it. Well, when she was really young, that was covered with hair too, but she's not living just 30 to 45 days. She's living year after year, and that constant going in and out of the cell rubs all the hair off of that plate. Um, it, it's a little more pronounced even when she's born than it is with the worker bees, but she is more fuzzy when she is a virgin queen as opposed to a year-old queen. Ah, uh, she's also... 30 to 40 percent bigger than the other bees in the colony, but um, it's like where's Waldo looking for your queen? Maybe because they all look the same, kind of, until you find that one that's a little different. Yeah, a little bigger, longer tail, well, not tail, but longer butt. Yep, longer abdomen. And that's that's because of all the eggs she's laying. She just needs to have room for the egg production and having a fully developed reproductive system, as opposed to her her children and sisters that. Uh, are missing some of those parts because they never got, we'll get into the B biology later, I don't want to confuse you on stuff. Let's uh, talk about Mark real quick, because 
There's always questions about okay. that, yeah, that mark. So that mark does not happen uh, naturally. Um, bee breeders, like myself, when we go to harvest the queens, I'd say seven out of 10 beekeepers out there that breed queens just automatically mark all their queens. There's gonna be some companies that'll charge you an extra two or three bucks to get a marked queen, but pretty much everybody wants a marked queen. Whether you're a beginner or you own 10,000 colonies, you like marked queens because it helps you find them a lot easier. It also tells you the age of the queen. Uh, there is a rotation of colors that tell you how old the, the queen is. I haven't looked up this year. I it's don't know what this yellow. year's color is. It's either white or yellow. Last year was blue. So whatever comes after blue. <laughs> I, I, I should know this just off the top of my head, but it's so easy for me in like, you know, February, March to just look it up. And then I go to the hardware store and I pick up a few paint pens and I just have them on hand then for that whole year think, when I'm breeding queens. Yellow, but I'm not, I'll, I can look. I it can look doesn't matter. Yeah. But, so but anyhow, know. bee breeders paint that dot on it because A, everybody wants it done and B, it's so much easier for you guys as beginning beekeepers and even experienced beekeepers to be able to find her right away. Because you pull a frame out and nothing spots her as much as just a colored dot on the frame. In fact, that photo that we passed around, that's a breeder queen there that even has a plate put on her back that has a number 22, if you saw on the photo there. That just means that she was number 22 that was bred by that, uh, probably artificially inseminated through special equipment that, yeah, that is possible to do with honeybees. They, they, that is demanded of breeder queens in a lot of it, situations. Because for breeder queens, you're spending like 100, 150 bucks on a queen. I've seen them go as high as $700 yeah. because you want special genetics. So they're taking drones that they're plucking out of colonies that they have been tracking the genetics of. They're harvesting the semen from them. It's in tiny glass tubes that are basically just when the glass is hot they just pull it out as a thin strand and clip it off and but they're able to take that uh, the semen and artificially inseminate the queen that also came from a special breeding line to give you all the genetics that you wanted in those, those beads. I was wrong last year was white this year is yellow so <laughs> it's, right. it's okay yeah all right so nice. that's finding the queen some of that stuff will help you out other times you're still going to sit there and go, I have gone through this hive two, three times and I can't find it. It, it happens. You yes? Did the queen lay the eggs in the, uh, what do you call them, the little tubes? The in the cells, tubes? yes. The, the queen, queen does, does the whole hive laying eggs. She doesn't lay that, in one place and the egg, the, the worker bees take it somewhere else. No, 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 no. Uh, that's all the queen really does is she walks around. She looks in a cell. She checks it out to see if it's already got an egg. If it doesn't, she turns around. Drops an egg, goes to the one next to it, checks it out, drops it. She usually works around in sort of like an expanding circular pattern there. You'll get sort of this beautiful football shape on it. Um, we probably have a slide coming up one. here and stuff, but um, anyhow, she, she fills up the frames that way. And when a frame is mostly done, she'll crawl to the other side or she'll jump across to the other frame and keep doing that. So yes. is there only one queen per hive? Yes, there's only one queen per hive. In very rare circumstances, you can sometimes get a hive that has a mother-daughter. Um, <coughs> that usually happens when the hive is thinking about swarming, which is something we'll get into at a later state, but they decide not to swarm, but they've already started making some queen cells and one of those daughters will hatch out. She goes around and kills her sisters that haven't hatched yet, but she doesn't necessarily fight with her mother. A lot of times they would. A lot of times the mother-daughter would fight, but if there's a really good nectar flow going on, and for some reason the hive is super docile, super calm and everything, you can have a mother and a daughter in a colony, and oh my gosh, does that colony just blow up exponentially. Because now you have two queens laying 1,500 eggs a day. You have all that many more worker bees that are building comb, bringing in nectar. It, it just goes, balls out and grows like no other and produces tons of honey. 
When fall time comes, though, that mother-daughter colony, some point, mother-daughter don't see eye-to-eye -eye anymore when uh, resources are drying up, cold weather setting in, and it always fixes itself. So, cool. Oh, and that's there. So, the queen was really good at laying here because you just see all of a sudden, boom, here. But a lot of times what you're going to see is so much of this is going to be in the covered over uh, metamorphosing state. And then you're going to see a bunch of thick fat larvae, and then you're going to see little larvae, and then you're going to see eggs on the outside there. Because the queen was basically working and expanding out there with her egg laying there. But here's a beautiful frame of larvae that are of capped over brood. That is what you want to see there. Yeah, she'll miss a few spots, or it could be that um, some hives have a hygienic behavior, and if a, a larva has some level of disease in it, they'll go ahead and pluck out that larva. If it smells weird, uh, if there's too many mites in there, there's a varroa hygienic sensitivity there to some types of bees, and that could have been capped over, but the bees smelled that there was some mites in there that were making the larva, the, the metamorphosing bee, the pupating bee, uh, sick in there, and they'll uncap it, and they'll pull the larva out and dump it out of the hive with the mites attached to it. So that's some of those traits. So just because you see a few spots, not a bad thing. If you see tons of spots, that's, that'll be something we cover in the disease chapter, and it'll, it'll make you look deeper into what's going on in your hive. Couple, couple more things about this. So you'll hear us use the term good brood pattern. That is a good brood pattern. Uh, you got a little honey up in the corner, get of the hive, and the corner closest to Jason, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of pollen down there too. Tiny bit of pollen right, right there, all, a few cells. All that, all those resources in, in one place makes for an efficient reproduction of bees, right? They don't have pollen way over here, the bees gotta get, they get everything organized. Things are right with that hive, they're, they're doing well. All right, social insect. Okay. So here you have a colony insect, and the bees are all working together in a harmony to be a sort of living organism all on its own. So you have the bees there that are going out and foraging with some of their job duties, like I was talking about. Some of them are caring for brood, some of them are defending the hive, some of them are building parts of the hive there. So uh, they, a social insect lives as a large colony with different job duties. Uh, division of labor, overlapping generations there. So I mean, I kind of already covered that stuff there talking a little bit earlier. Um, what's the next slide? It is the actual uh, cast of bees. Okay. Well, the three main types of bees in the hive is drone bee, right there. Um, he's going to be basically the same mass as the queen, possibly even a little bit more, just a little bit less, depending on how big your queen is. They do vary in size there. But uh, drones are big, fat, furry guys there. They don't have a stinger, so if you ever want to pick one up, Feel free to grab it by the wings or whatever there. But drones are the boy bees, and their only purpose is to someday maybe find a queen that has uh, gone out on her mating flight, and they only go on one mating flight. So that queen, when she's born, she kills her sisters. Uh, about three days later, she'll go on her mating flight. She will go to an area known as a drone congregation yard. All of that simply is, is an area where there's like a nice wind break that the boy bees like to collect in the afternoon. And they fly around there hoping that a queen comes to that area. Well, the queens look for that same type of environment and they hopefully find anywhere from 12 to 20 boys that they have nuptials with and come back to the colony. And that's, that's it. The queen never again goes on a mating flight. She is good for the next three to seven years of her life after doing that. She has a, this is where we get into some more of the biology there. She has a special organ inside of her body called sperm fecum. It just looks, if, if you ever see a dissection of a queen bee, it looks sort of like a crystal ball. 
And if she's been mated really well, it'll look like a nice white crystal ball. If she hasn't been mated at all or poorly mated, it will go back to levels where it's clear glass to kind of foggy glass or whatever. But it is, if, if I did it by human standards here, it's about that big. And that will store enough semen that lasts the queen up to seven years. Uh, she has um, a small little trap door inside of her body that when she is going to go around and lay an egg, it allows her to release one or two semen out of the spermatheca onto the egg that she's going to be laying and do a fertilized egg that will turn into a worker bee. If she goes onto a frame there that she decides to start laying some drones on and has some extra large cells on it for the drones to develop in, she will keep that flap closed and she'll lay unfertilized eggs there. Unfertilized eggs turn into boy bees. So anyhow, back to the worker class. You have the drone that is boy bees and does zero work in the hive. Uh, brings in no resources, does not defend the hive. Literally, all through the summertime, it is amazing to be a boy bee because you're in the hive and the girls are feeding you, they're cleaning you, they're taking care of you. You decide, heck, it's afternoon, I'm going to go scoop the loop and see if I can't pick up a chick. Nope, didn't, didn't find anybody, I'm going to come back, get another you know, meal from the girls, and I'm going to head back out again. Oh, didn't meet anybody. Are they not welcome in not just their own hive, but in any hive? Uh, for, the, for the most part, they, they can get into other hives. There's uh, drifting that happens with them, okay. the same as with the, the worker bees and stuff there. But anyhow, so it's great to be a drone in the summertime. If you actually do meet that, that queen of your life, um, that kind of sucks because you die immediately afterward. Uh, but um, the, the part that sucks about being a drone is you get into fall time and you're a drone bee and those days are getting shorter and it's getting colder, the girl bees decide to kick you out of the hive. You're, you're a freeloader at that point. Winter's coming. They can't stand to have you around it. And the hive as a social living biological entity knows that no queen on a 30 degree day can go out and fly and get mated. So there's no point of keeping the bees around until, or the drones around until spring comes. So they'll kick you out of the hive. If you try flying and getting back in there, they'll kick you out again. If you are persistent about it, well, guess what? The girls start chewing your legs and wings off and kick you out of the hive. And at that point, you can't get back in. So in the fall time, it, it, it kind of sucks to be the freeloader. All right, queen, you only have one in the hive and her job is to lay all the eggs like I talked about. Worker bee is the other type. Those are all the girl bees that did not get fed that royal jelly in massive amounts, again, we keep touching on that. That is what actually transforms the queen there, is getting massive amounts of royal jelly when she's in the larval stages. So when the hive goes queenless or has a failing queen that they can smell is getting kind of rough, maybe she's not laying eggs properly, maybe she got kind of squished between frames when you were doing a bee inspection, she's just getting old for, you know, because she's five to seven years old and she's getting ragged there her scent changes. So they'll start, they'll go ahead and they'll take 30 cells in the hive and they'll feed it massive amounts of royal jelly. And they'll do that all the way up to the point of it getting capped over. That massive diet triggers genes in that worker bee's body and makes it grow extra fast so that it develops in a much shorter period of time. It develops 40% bigger and it develops the spermatheca and the ovaries and stuff that the worker bee, well, it has ovaries, sorry. Right. It gets the spermatheca anyhow, and the worker bee doesn't. So anyhow, the worker bee for the caste system does everything. Uh, so that's uh, a question. Oh, so you're, you said a whole bunch of them will be fed the massive amounts of jelly, but then- There will be about 30 of the cells in, in a healthy colony, naturally. I would say the average is about 30 cells that it'll draw out. You might have a colony that only does 15 cells. It may be a smaller colony. It may have something else going on or be weak for some reason and only do 15. You might have another one that's a jumbo colony and then does 45, but you, you typically find around 30 when they want to 
replace their queen naturally or need to do an emergency queen switch. So then the, then the first one born is the queen and the rest is not killed? Not a hundred percent. The first one born tries to go around and kill her sisters, but if there's 29 others she's got to kill, well, she goes over there and she, the queen has a barbless stinger. And she only uses it to kill other competing queens. She hates the scent of them and stuff. So she'll go over to the cells and start trying to stab through them. Sometimes before she gets to the 29th queen, another one will emerge or several of them have emerged in that time frame. And then they start a battle royal trying to do it. But sooner or later, one queen emerges as the biggest, strongest, and having killed off all of her other sisters. They actually kind of call each other out. It's, it's a, I've heard it a couple times. They do this thing called piping for virgin queens, queens that haven't made it yet. It'll make this high-pitched sound that other queens can find, and then that's how kind of they kind of find each other in the eye that way and take it down to one. I, I think it kind of sounds like... Uh, I'm if sorry. you took a mallard duck and gave it helium, yeah, because it's like re 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 re. I actually have this video projector doesn't play sound, but I actually have a piping queen video on my, on here. If I can get speakers to this, I'll I'll play it. It's it's kind of neat. Something you don't hear in your VR. If you ever buy a box of queens because you're going to do, I know you're very you're beginning beekeepers and you can't fathom buying 50 queens at one time. But if you buy a box of queens, it'll keep singing to you because the queens are challenging each other inside the box. Okay, next slide. Yeah, cool. So worker here. Yeah. Yep. Worker so bee flying through the air. I talked about this already. Yeah. If you want to just pop to the next. I did. Let's, there we go. Oh, I covered most of this already. Sorry about that. I normally cover the queen chapter and stuff here, so this is a. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here on things, but I don't think uh, we missed anything here. I think you've hit on that. Nope, did. Okay, so uh, queen's next, right? We've talked about queen. Big bulky queen, her duties. 15 eggs a day. Queen pheromone, which was the queen substance I talked about there. Um, stimulates foraging and hold workers in a state of reproductive. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that is one of the things. One of the scents or pheromones that the queen releases there. So all of her children that are worker bees there technically can lay eggs. Okay. But because the queen is there and she's emitting this uh, pheromone scent there, their ovaries are shut down and shriveled up and aren't doing anything. If for some reason that colony loses the queen, and they try to make a new queen, but they fail at it, which would be case scenario, the, the, the biggest, baddest queen that killed all of her sisters, well, she goes on that mating flight, and while she's on that mating flight, a dragonfly picks her off. Well, the time frame that it took for that queen to develop from egg into a queen and hatch out, there's no more young larva from the old queen in the hive there that they could try a second chance with. And at that point, they're, they're hopelessly queenless, so that, that pheromone scent from the queen is gone, gone. Mother Nature, as a last-ditch effort to perpetuate the genetics of the hive, those uh, worker bees that weren't laying eggs before, some of them, with that queen gone and the pheromone scent gone, their ovaries will start to swell up and activate. And they'll start laying a whole bunch of unfertilized eggs, which I told you earlier, turn into boy bees. So this colony that's hopelessly queenless starts producing tons and tons and tons of boys on a massive scale as it diminishes in population, as food stores run out because they're hopelessly queenless. They're in a state of panic. They don't do a very good job of foraging. They're not bringing in pollen. They're, they know that their days are counted. So they just produce tons and tons of boys, which then can go out into nature and maybe find queens and carry on their genetics. But at that point, they know their days are numbered and they're gonna die. And that's a last ditch effort for them to pass on their genes to the next, next colony that would form out there. So the hive itself won't make it. Typically another hive would, or something else will move in and, and take over eventually, but yeah, just the genetics. 
It would depend on your disease load. It would depend on um, chemicals in the environment that are getting into your hive. If you had a perfectly clean hive with no chemicals, no disease, no mites, no problems going on, most of those eggs would actually hatch into bees um, and get through the life cycle. I'll bet it's 95 to better, even in a regular two, three year old hive. That so when, when she, and she's not laying 1,500 eggs a day year round. That's that's seasonal, right? That's gonna that that's your summer months. In yeah. the winter, she shuts down almost 100%. Uh, late winter, she just starts turning on because the days are getting longer and stuff. There, early spring, she's not. She, you know, maybe she's laying 500, uh, 800 eggs a day. But when the main summer hits and your nectar flow is going on, 1,500 eggs a day. So we, we talked about staying ahead of your bees just a little bit, and we'll, you know, we'll hit it more in the classes, but, but yeah, at 1,500 bees a day, if you only visit your hive once a month, you may show up and everything's under control and they have plenty of space, and we'll talk about bee space later, and they're not in dangerous form, and you come back 30 days later, it is overflowing with bees. They, they have decided the space is too small, they're leaving, or they're going to they're gonna have them to swarm away, that, that can happen because of that, that reproduction curve, you know, in uh, April, May, June, is really sharp. Really so sharp. I, don't worry about that stuff yet. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the chapters of the book there where we'll talk about inspections and what to look for, and also uh, your nectar flows and how that can change the behavior of your hive. So. so will we also talk about how to keep our bees from leaving us? Yes. Yes, yes, yes we will, because yes. that's a fun part. <laughs> okay, uh, just a drone here. And then uh, some drone If you want to go back to uh, the picture of the drone. Uh, the picture? Sure. Yeah. So besides having this really like fat tank-like body there, notice his eyes there. Go back uh, two photos ago. Or the queen, she, the worker? worker bee. Much smaller eye on the bee. And then back to the drone here. Huge. Those jumbo eyes, uh, along with... The big antenna there and stuff there is so when he's flying around that drone congregation yard, he can see the queen better, he can spot her at a distance. Uh, he's got the, the extra large antenna there so he can smell her in the air and track her down. Now he's also built like a tank there because to mate with the queen, he literally latches onto her body in mid-flight and he's then kind of... Uh, helping support them in the, the flying prop. They're both both trying to fly, but he impedes a lot of the queen's ability to fly. And he needs to be able to take over that and stuff. So he's really built for just that one purpose there, being oversized and, and having special uh, body features to find her and be able to uh, mate in mid-flight. Go ahead. The drone congregation yard, is it? Near the colony or the hive where the drone is from, he's trying to intercept queen from that same hive, or did he, he go somewhere else? I would think for genetic diversity purposes, he'd want to get a queen from a different hive and not mate with his own sister, right? All right. The, the university studies behind it, there, there's a few parts to this. Drones like to stay within a quarter mile of their hive. So if you look on Google Maps and you see where your hive is at, and you just draw a circle at about a quarter mile in all ranges, and then you look for structures there like a tree line or a large barn building, or um, a rock wall bluff, or anything like that, you can picture that's where your drones are probably hanging out in that quarter mile section. <laughs> Queens uh, like to fly a mile from their hive on that mating flight and try to find a drone congregation yard. So if you draw a circle or a mile zone there, that's where the queens are going because they're trying to find boy bees that aren't their brothers. Right. Now, if, say you live in the middle of a whole bunch of corn and soybean fields, or just grassland and stuff, and your beehives are the only ones within like 5, 10 miles of you, those queens are going to be like, huh, there's no boys at a mile. There's no boys at a half mile. And as they're coming back there, then they will mate with boys that are from your own apiary and stuff. That's actually how... Um, 
bee breeders that are doing specialized breeds like Russians, we will try to control all the bee yards within one mile radius, mile and a half radius of where we're going to have our mating yards at. And I, I essentially do that because, um, well, I do that through having multiple yards all throughout my area there. Um, any of the high hobbyists that are within a mile of half of me, I just give them free queens all the time and I keep their hives rushing too. I have had it that one beekeeper didn't want my Russian bees, but when I keep 100 colonies in that area and they've got two colonies, in the next few years their colonies are going to become more and more and more Russian because, guess what, they're not mating right next to their two colonies, they're mating in my drone congregation area and they're continuing to get, oh, that first year they just got a 50-50 queen. Year number two, they now have a 75-25 queen, etc. So sooner or later, you might as well just take my queens if you're anywhere near me there in the Somerset area. But that's called a closed mating population as opposed to open mating your queens where you just have your few colonies, you've got a neighbor up the street, you've got another one a mile down from you, and your queens are mating with whoever out there. Thank you, that most of us are Did I fully answer that question, or is... Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, touch the motion to this. <sighs> so it's... Honeybees are a superorganism. All right. So I talked about the life cycles of the honeybees inside of the colony. Well, the colony itself is this living organism. Um, honeybee colonies perpetuate themselves in nature by every time they get too cramped on space, get too big, they decide to swarm, okay? Swarming is the term where the colony basically says, hey, we're too cramped on space, and the worker bees decide to stop feeding the queen, and they'll start chasing her around the colony, actually. Uh, they stop feeding her and basically put her on a treadmill so that her abdomen uh, loses weight and gets smaller and her wings then have the ability to let her fly again. Because when she was a virgin queen, I, I know we didn't really cover that, when she was a virgin queen her abdomen was smaller and her wings were uh, able to carry her weight at that time and when she came back and she became this 1500, day, uh, 1500 eggs a day laying machine, she fattens up and she gets a lot bigger and she can't fly at that point. Well, when the colony decides it's time to swarm, they start chasing her around the colony and they make her lose weight. At the same time that they're doing that, they start taking 20, 30, 45 cells in there and they'll make them into queen cells through feeding them massive amounts of royal jelly. The day or two before those cells are going to hatch, that queen is skinny enough and they chase her right out the front door and she flies up into a tree and somewhere around 60%, 70% of the colony flies out the front of the hive with her and they'll hang as a giant mass off that tree and that's called a swarm. And the hive that is left behind there hatches out a new queen. Well, that, that swarm that's hanging off a tree there, they'll send out scout bees and they'll find some container out there, be it a, a hollow tree a uh, soffit of your home, uh, an old farmhouse that has no insulation in the walls and they find a little crack there and they move down into it. They love to find something that's like three to five gallons of empty space inside of it and they'll move inside of there and form a brand new colony there. So that is how Mother Nature takes the bee colony and turns it into two bee colonies. And they, as they grow, then it'll split into four colonies then because each one of them will want to swarm and form new colonies. So that is how, as a superorganism, they perpetuate their species other than the queen laying eggs and going on like that. So termites are very much a, a organism out there that lives as a giant organism. However, when termites decide to reproduce their colonies, they send out multiple queens and stuff, and they'll set up a lot of them, whereas the honeybee just literally is splitting itself in two. Uh, a really productive colony might split itself twice in a season. Um, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't do it over and over again. Um, there's one exception. 
if you get down into like Texas uh, and Florida and stuff like that, you'll come across a special kind of bee known as an Africanized bee. That bee there, instead of laying 1,500 eggs a day, lays 300 to 3,500 eggs a day. And it can actually swarm five, seven, eight times in a season. And how do I put this? You don't have to worry about Africanized bees here in Iowa because those same traits that make the queen lay all those tons of eggs and swarm and propagate itself, the queens also never shut down their laying process. They need a tropical environment with multiple nectar flows uh, because they don't do like normal Apis mellifera, the Euro European honeybee, and uh, handle a winter time. If it was winter time and you have an Africanized colony, that queen's still laying 3,500 eggs a day and needs so much food that in about four weeks' time, they're out of, they've run out of any sort of food resources in the hive and they die of starvation. So they're really locked into tropical locations. So, sorry, I went off subject there. But. We'll also have a, at least half, a, half an evening where we're talking about swarming management so that if you don't want your hive to swarm, which you don't, how, what can you do to, to manage that in your favor? So you can, like you can pretty much count on if you have one queen, you're not, and it's a seven, it's a life for seven years, you're not going to have it for seven years. No, probably not. So typic typically, you're doing a good job if you have the same queen for three or four years there, and she's still laying eggs, doing a beautiful brood pattern and stuff, but sooner or later, you, me, everybody goofs up and... We didn't pay attention, they got cramped on space and they swore. Uh, a lot of times also you'll notice that your hive might be having some brood pattern issues just because um, maybe at three years she wasn't mated with as many boys as she should have and she is running out of the um, sperm in her spermafica to be able to properly lay the brood pattern that she should. So. A lot of times, what you are going to experience is going to be three to four year old queens. I, I did have one for, it was five years and I had to replace her going into year six there. It was one of my first queens that I ever tried marking myself, and this was years and years ago. But the first time I ever tried marking a queen, um, that paint pen, I was messing with it and like, I couldn't get enough paint to really come out nice on her and stuff there. So I, I hit the pen a few times over there, and then when I went to mark her, it just went all over her. And I thought they were gonna kill her off, because at that point I'm like, oh, I've got paint down her abdomen, it's probably blocking some of her um, spiracles for breathing, it was all down one of her wings and stuff, and it was metallic, metallic red paint, so it's like just glistening everywhere and stuff there, and probably glued those two wings together. But they left her alone, and she, I had her then for, Five years going into six, and at five years, I noticed that she was failing, but I got such beautiful grafts and colonies off of her that I just let her go until they requeened her at some point. I moved her into a nuke when she was starting to fail me and stuff there, and I still just kept grafting off of her because the colonies I got from her were just so amazing. So. The colony will also kind of detect it whenever a queen is starting to fail, and their goal is survival. If the queen isn't doing it, they'll, they'll, they'll supersede her is what they'll do. They'll, they'll replace her. And again, we'll get into that in future, future classes. Um, All right, so overwintering. We've got a whole chapter coming up on that. But. All right, so a few th I'll, I'll cover a few things here. Um, I get asked this all the time by the general public. What do the bees do in the wintertime? Do they hibernate like bears and stuff like that? No, when it starts getting cold outside, bees will move, instead of being spread out on all the frames in the hive, they start moving closer and closer and closer together in the hive to conserve heat. Uh, at some point there, when it starts getting cold enough outside and in the colony there, they will move into a tight cluster and they start vibrating their wing muscles. And that vibration there creates friction heat that warms the mass there. And uh, 
the bees on the outside that are kind of getting cold, they'll be sort of like penguins in a winter storm. And they'll say, hey, I'm going to turn inside on the warmth. And the bees that were warm on the inside will slowly move to the outside there. And this mass will just stay really tight in a ball there and slowly move throughout the honey supers eating their winter stores. The center of that mass will stay about 92, 93 degrees all through the winter time there through that process. Um, their metabolism does slow down during this time, so they require less food and they, they look kind of sluggish. Uh, if you were to pop that lid open on a day that's, you know, 35, 45 degrees, the bees will hardly be moving in there compared to what you're used to and stuff. But they're just fine. They're still alive. They're just in that state there. And that's part of what allows them to live the three to four months to get through the winter time that they need to before springtime kicks around. Another part of their wintering is that 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 last generation that the bees are trying to rear up there, um, they're, they're just a different kind of bee, basically. They're getting a heftier diet. They have a thicker layer of uh, fat lipids on their abdomen and stuff. Uh, they just are meant to live a little longer than the typical bee and stuff there. So slow down metabolism, extra fat in their system, everything else there, that's your winter cluster. Um, brood rearing is, okay, um, yeah, and most breeds of bees, when fall time kicks in, one of the traits that happens there is that the queen's going to, instead of laying 1,500 day, eggs a day, she slows down to 1,000, then she slows down to maybe 750, and at some point, uh, breeds like Carniolans, Russians, Buckfast, most of them out there, We'll have a period of time where the queen just stops laying entirely. And then that winter cluster, like I described, just goes ahead and eats food and is waiting it out for springtime to happen. Italian hives are the one breed there that um, they're considered the industry standard bee for the southern half of the United States because they've been developed to always keep a giant cluster of bees, always have a ton of population in there, and the queens really don't like to shut down. They still only lay about 1,500 eggs a day, but when all these other breeds stop laying or at least start slowing down and stuff, they're just going full bore, 1,500 eggs a day, 1,500 eggs a day. At some point, they do slow down because that when they mass up as a cluster there, the queen's not going to jump outside of that cluster to lay eggs. She's stuck in there, and they can only keep so many eggs warm inside of there, so it's, at some point she does diminish her egg lay, but she never really wants to stop. Uh, so what that does um, for a northern area, you've got to leave extra honey on the hives that nobody else does. If you want to run Italians here in Iowa, just give them another 20-30% honey than you would any of the other breeds, bee breeds, and you should do just fine. That's the one thing you would have to do different. Uh, people love Italians still because if you're a commercial bee producer or a commercial pollinator, if you're sending your bees out to California for pollination contracts, those hives that have a really big population, they get paid. If you send bees out there and they've got a, a tight cluster and not a lot of bees in there, uh, you may get a cheaper pollination contract, you may get uh, lower fees, your bees may not even get placed. So people that are into pollination love Italians for that reason. So if you see a guy with 3,000, 5,000 colonies here and he says he runs all Italians, that's why he's shipping them out there and it's a great bee for that. For your hobbyist, it's still a great bee, just give an extra honey. Um, I think we got just a few more slides. Oh, shoot. Yep, I need to hurry up. All right. Bring reproduction. Bring reproduction stimulated by the presence of fresh pollen here. All right, so sometime here in uh, January, it, your days start getting longer. Uh, you hit that solstice time or whatever. And it just happens, yeah. Shortest day of the year, pretty much. Shortest day of the year hits, and the, when your days start getting longer, some of your hives start waking up and they'll try doing a little bit of brood rearing. 
they might just on one frame have a mass like this. But the hives start waking up. And as you get into late January, February time, they start doing a little bit more than that. But still they stay mainly shut down because it's winter months here. At some point there, um, you start getting days where the bees get out there and they start foraging. Maybe they're not finding anything. But sometime in May, you get trees that start budding out. You and I, we may see those trees starting to bud out and we think leaves are coming out, but like maple trees, the first thing that they're actually doing is a blossom that's coming out, but it's the same color as like the leaves that are going to be coming out and you and I don't see it, but the bees do. So they're getting a little bit of nectar and pollen off of that. Uh, oak trees do it, though they, that's not a good example because oak has a little bit of bitterness and poison for the bees, but it's still a pollen source that they'll hit in the early beginning there. Um, all of your trees that start budding out will have some food sources for the bees. There's other uh, early blooming uh, uh, forest type tulips and things like that that'll happen at that time. You get a little bit later on there and all of a sudden you get the first dandelions. And that, that really triggers your hive to blow up because dandelions are just packed with pollen. And that pollen coming in the front door in massive amounts makes the queen just lay eggs, lay eggs, lay eggs, and the colony gets real excited, and that's what basically happens in the early spring. Okay, so let's, let's call it here, because the next slide has to do with swarming. We probably want to give more time to that. So let's start with okay. that next week. Next week's topic is also equipment, so it's usually kind of shorter, shorter uh, than what we've done tonight. Let's, uh, so who here is feeling a little overwhelmed? We want a lot of information, right? Before we break or call night, any questions we can answer for you? You had a lot of information. Come part, out of part of this, why it's six weeks long uh, with two hour class sessions, as we go along, any of the stuff that seems fuzzy from previous time, you can bring up as questions. And it'll repeat in the class too. And it repeats yeah. in different chapters, the stuff that's going on. Yeah. It, it will get driven home for you. And even when the class is in, you can keep reaching out to us for questions. I mean, I'm required not only as the president, as a master beekeeper, as a business owner, um, all these things. I, I, I have an education background and everything. I, anytime somebody calls me day in and day out, I'll sit on the phone for two hours with you if you have questions. I don't care. I'm self-employed. I make time for people. And also, the advice I give is always going to be impartial. I don't give a dang if you buy Russian bees from me. I'll be happy if you go to Ebert and buy Italian bees. I'll be happy if you go to Spring Valley and get Carniolan bees. I don't care if you ever shop for me. I just want you to be successful with bees. So I'm going to always be impartial with my advice. You had a question. When's it get too late to order them? Ah, uh, for nukes. Yeah. Uh, well, there's two different types, packages and nukes. Nukes, uh, they're usually a lot fewer people, a lot uh, smaller supply of nukes there. You're going to have different people running out, like right now, as of tonight, I have eight nukes left in what I'm going to produce for the year that people can buy. However, I have like 85, 90% of my inventory still available on packages for Carniolans and Russians. and those will still be available to buy probably in first week into April yet you could buy them. Uh, Spring Valley Honey Farms, I bet you could still buy a nuke from them for another month. Uh, different producers have different inventory that they're going to have and with my Russians I just got hit really hard in January for my nukes and they're already down to that dwindling point. So. If you want nukes, different people sell out early on those if you're okay with packages. And we're going to cover the benefits and downfalls of both types. There is no best product between those two. If somebody tells you the absolute best way to start bees is with a nuke, they're trying to sell you a nuke. Okay? There is just as many good points to buy in a package as there are good points to buy in a nuke. And if you do care in a certain way with a package or care in a certain way with the nuke, they are both just as successful, give you just as big of a hive and just as best of results by the end of the season 
There is no difference in all of those things. So there is no right way. Again, a lot of things in beekeeping, it's going to be impartial advice and it's what works best for you. Maybe you want the guarantees of some honey stores there inside of a nuke in case you got a week of bad weather and you didn't want to open up the hive and feed it. But another person didn't want to spend the extra bucks for a nuke and they were perfectly okay opening that hive and feeding it. Both are going to get you through that week of bad weather. Mm -hmm. So I just so. need the lingo again. What's a nuke? A nuke is a nucleus colony that is four or five frames of bees inside of a box. Basically somebody just went in their hive, pulled some frames out, put it in the box, and one of several ways introduced a queen to it. It is a fully functioning hive all on its own, and you just take it, and you put it in your own equipment, and it spreads out. The package is a whole bunch of loose bees without a home, and a queen in there that has already been mated and ready to go, and you just dump it into your hive there, and the bees start building wax on the frames and moving out from there. Packages traditionally cost 30, maybe 35% less than a nuke. Uh, a package is going to give you a pound to a pound and a half more bees than what's actually in the nuke. It, it actually has a higher population to start up, but that's to build the wax extra fast. Uh, on those frames, you just can't, on five frames, fit as many bees into that given space as what just inside of that container they can dump bees up. So really, I mean, after about a month, month and a half, I don't notice a difference between a hive started off of a nuke and a hive started off of a package. They normally have gone to town. If you've done the right things. If you've done the right things, yes. Cool. All right. So we'll talk equipment, right? So read uh, chapters one, two. We'll cover most of what we did tonight. Chapter three covers beekeeping equipment. We'll actually have a table kind of more centered probably next week and equipment on there. Um, if you have questions along the way, uh, ask them now or bring them when you come back next Thursday. We can probably have a little bit of a Q&A time before we get started next week and then uh, to kind of tie up any loose ends that you might have and then we'll, we'll dig in again.